uh, and he was talking about what he calls, uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, halephobia or hulephobia, but he's uh, coining this term um, where the the, the, the first uh, part of the compound there, hule or hyl, H-Y-L-E, is how it's transliterated in, in English, but it's a Greek word that means um, literally wood, um, but it's often translated as matter, so it's sort of the, the stuff of which things are made. Um, so Aristotle sort of metaphorically um, uh, employed this term, hule, and what he meant was that the way, you know, in the same way that a craftsman, a woodworker, will um, shape wood into a piece of furniture or, um, you know, what have you, uh, form will, will shape matter. And that, that without form, matter is just a sort of chaotic, um, raw nothing. And form gives it its shape and it's the direction of its movement uh, and and its purpose and without form matter has none of that and so can't really even be grasped by the mind because for the mind to grasp it it would have to impose its forms upon it and so already you know in Aristotle with his understanding of matter the whole um, of you know, and Aristotle got it from Plato, really, so I guess in Plato's understanding of matter, uh, the, the whole development of Western philosophy through the next 2,500 years was, was implicit, was enfolded, and only needed to unfold. Um, the envelope merely had to be developed. Um, because in that Aristotelian picture, there's already the Kantian... Uh, position, which is just a further refinement or reflexive understanding of what Aristotle had um, decreed, uh, which is that the mind can only know form. The mind cannot know matter without form, without a kind of mediation, uh, which immediately, you know, <laughs> leads us into Hegel uh, and his understanding of matter. In its relation to you know, what uh, what he called mind or spirit or geist, um, so we're left with a picture where, uh, as the um, blog post uh, discussing uh, was discussing, we're left with a picture where the mind seems unable to deal with matter in. Um, in its own terms, uh, and so matter tends to be erased, um, obscured, or neglected uh, in in our our thought about reality. Even in those who claim to be materialists, you know, like uh, Daniel Dennett and uh, Richard Dawkins, and their sort of gene centric view of biology, they basically, uh, you know, they'll talk about the substrate independence of the information that uh, the genetic, um, you know, the, the nucleic acids uh, in our nucleus are coding for. Um, they'll say that this information is independent of its material, uh, you know, molecular substrate. And, you know, that is a kind of erasure of the contingencies of the material matrix within which that code or that information is interpreted. You know, um, developmental uh, systems biologists uh, and um, you know philosophers of biology like Evan Thompson will talk about the necessity of uh, an autopoetic or self-producing um, organism, a living individual, uh, for there to be any replication of a genetic code, so that um, to think of the molecules, the 
rather inert molecules, the, the nucleic acids within the nucleus as somehow the uh, formal operator um, or the efficient cause, in fact, of the entire organismic process is 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 to put the cart before the the horse in some sense to have this kind of inverted upside down um, idealist understanding of uh, a living physiological process. So it takes a whole cell for for the DNA to mean anything, and it's only in the context of the cell that DNA has a meaning and can can act as information. Outside of a living cell, the DNA is not information anymore. It's inner, inert molecules which will quickly um, um, fragment and turn, you know, just entropy will take hold and it'll just dissolve uh, independently of the living matrix of a, of a cell, uh, of a self-organizing, self-producing cell. So but then we'll also see uh, an erasure of matter in, in much, not only in biology, and supposedly materialistic biologists, but we'll see the erasure of matter in um, dialectical materialism and in Marxism. Uh, even though Marx claimed to stand Hegel on his feet, you know, by interpreting his spiritual philosophy and his phenomenology, in uh, um, in terms of, of, of class force uh, class struggle and um, you know the force of the industrial process um, even Marx though you know ultimately thinks that ideas his you know communist theory can be uh, imposed upon history and you know human society from the ivory tower of, ac of the academic scientific establishment uh, and that the theory could somehow um, make history conform with its uh, to its will to the to the ideal utopian um, society that it had constructed formally or in the space of of ideas. Now, of course, Marx, uh, standing Hegel on his feet, did turn Hegel's philosophy into a world historical force. Um, even if even if communism is a seems a lost cause now, you know, so does capitalism, and um, it's clear that capitalism can only survive as such while it had the great uh, red uh, dragon in the east to compete with it. And capitalism itself has no competition; it collapses. Uh, it eats itself alive, and that's what we're, we, we've been witnessing for um, the last little bit in the recession since 2008, but even before that, you know, really since we went off the gold standard. And you could just keep pushing it back, at least since we went off the gold standard. There's been a sort of zombie capitalism that's been feeding on debt. Basically, it's eating itself. Um, and once the Berlin Wall collapsed and the, the communist enemy was no longer there, you know, we had to invent something new and we did the war on terror thing, but now we're all kind of over that and we I mean, you know, the, the older Tsnarev brother, the Boston bomber, may be dead, but the younger one's about to go on trial and he has a fan club. So we're starting to even, you know, our relationship to terrorism is fastly uh, shifting in some strange way. Um, so capitalism's imploding. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting off track here, but the, the basic idea is that uh, Marx, in his ideological critique of, of consumer capitalism, um, was still a kind of idealist, but I think he proved that Ideas can have historical impacts, though not the ones that they are designed to, right? So certainly we invent new ideas, we um, publish them, right? We talk about them and we write them down and we email them and post, post 
blogs about them, and they then have effects in, in the world. Um, but they often do not have the effects that one would have expected them to have um, when you had only been imagining or uh, you know, logically constructing them. So we don't always know the effects of our own ideas. Which means, I think, when we're talking about matter, um, we're talking about something that is, as Schelling put it, unprethinkable. Um, we, when we only consider um, the logical apparatus of our mind, then it, it can seem as though we know everything we could about matter a priori, right? So we are we already know all the concepts we might employ in order to understand matter, but that doesn't mean we understand matter. So it's not, matter is not a priori this way or that way. Matter is unprethinkable. It's un-a prioriable. Um, it is a kind of chaos in that sense, as Aristotle originally said, uh, or Plato before him. Um, matter, I think, we can best begin to uh, relate to, if not understand in a kind of logical, intellectual way, through reflection. If, if, if we were, if we're going to feel into the true nature of matter and, and learn to pay attention to its unique way of being in the world, or maybe becoming in the world, um, I think we can turn to the pre-Socratic philosophers. You know thinkers like uh, Heraclitus rather than Parmenides, um, thinkers like Empedocles, you know, um, Thales even, uh, you know, the elemental thinkers who thought nature as, um, you know, uh, a sort of uh, dynamic transaction among elemental forces, elemental powers, and that there was a sort of chaotic organizing uh, principle that, you know, it wasn't, a, wasn't designed in, in the, the more modern sense, um, but certainly organized, you know, so they, they, they had an organic understanding of, of what mattered, not, maybe not what it is, but what it does, how it becomes um, you know, there, and there wasn't for the ancient elemental philosophers a separation between something called mind, like subjective mind, uh, and something called um, mere matter, um, mere objectively present uh, matter. There was more of a mixture uh, of, um, of dynamic forces living forces, and so soul, you know, or as, as Staley's put it, um, you know, uh, there are gods in everything, uh, it's basically what he said, that everything has soul, which doesn't mean everything has uh, deliberating, conscious, self-reflexive, you know, um, proposition, judgment-wielding, uh, rationality in the sense that a human soul would have, but it means that there is a sort of interior life to things, that matter isn't just all surface. There's depth to it, and there's time to it. Um, and to say that matter partakes of time uh, in an existential sense, in the sense that time is there for matter, doesn't just blindly pass through it. That's to say something like that is to contradict uh, the entire phenomenological tradition, which itself is uh, the culmination of the transcendental tradition. And uh, really, you know, it's it is despite Heidegger's claim to uh, have been uh, critiquing Western metaphysics, his fundamental ontology is in a way the historical culmination of that very tradition. Um, but to say that matter partakes of time uh, is to, I think, 
it's the beginning of, of an enunciation of what uh, present day philosophy must attempt to do. I mean, that is the task of, of present day philosophy, uh, which is, you know, you can refer to it many ways. It's a kind of inversion of Platonism, maybe. Um, a deconstruction of metaphysics. You know, but of course, if we're really going to deconstruct metaphysics, then we got to be careful. We have to use words like matter and time and spirit gently, tactfully, uh, not hurl them around like weapons.